Study your Bible. Read your Bible. Be in the Word. John 3, 6, and the Word. Memorize this verse. Decipher the Word. Make sense of that passage. Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to those of you joining us online or out in the atrium or in the CLC, wherever you are. Uh, I'm just a little bit excited about spring. Anyone else? I'm, I'm tired of winter already. Uh, are you with me on this? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I'm ready to be outside. I'm ready to start breathing that non-recycled air again. I'm ready for our boys to start bouncing on the trampoline instead of bouncing off the walls. And parents, you know what I'm talking about? I'm excited about spring. I got a little excited about fall. I should say this. I got a little excited about fall uh, earlier in the week when I heard about Percy Harvin getting traded to the Seattle Seahawks. I'm just saying, you knew, some of you knew I was going to say that. Sorry. Uh, but I'm excited about spring. Spring. And so I brought my golf clubs up here. Uh, and I'm going to put them right, right in front, hoping that God will get the hint. Okay. <laughs> oh, was, do, you know, do you know how warm it was uh, this time last year? Do you know? 80 degrees today. And this morning when I got up, it was 8 degrees <laughs> today. So now that we're in a good mood, uh, let's talk about the series that we're in. Uh, we're in a series called 40 Days in the Word. 40 Days in the Bible. And uh, we're concluding the series today, and I hope that it's been helpful for you, this series. Uh, I think, personally, that this, every week of this series uh, has been uh, inspiring and informative and, and important, every week. But, but I want to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell Bill and Shay, okay? This week is the most important. Why? Because this is when the rubber hits the road. Applying the word is what we're talking about this morning, applying the word. How do we as Christ followers apply God's word, the Bible, to our lives? How do we put uh, God's words into practice in our lives as Christ followers? Now, and I, I know there are some of you in here, even as I say that, you wouldn't uh, necessarily consider yourself a Christ follower. And if that's the case, you probably um, aren't sure what you believe about the Bible, or maybe you are sure, maybe you, you don't believe. And if that's you, uh, here's what I want to say. It's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. We like to say at Hosanna that, that there's room to wrestle here at Hosanna with some of those questions, that there's room to be on the journey. So if that's you, you're on a journey here, you're not sure what you believe, we are genuinely grateful and glad and honored that you're here and glad you're along with uh, us for the ride. Now, I, I, I want to say this too, that if that's you, just a thought. Um, you don't have to believe the Bible to read it. Just think about that. I mean, most things we read, right, we don't necessarily believe it before we read it. We read it, and then we decide if we believe it, right? The same is true of the Bible. Um, so, so just give that some thought. But we are going to look at a passage from the Bible in Matthew. Now, who is Matthew? Matthew uh, was one of the four authors in the Bible who wrote about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, uh, one of the four authors. We call them the Gospels. And, and here's what's cool about Matthew. Prior to meeting Jesus, Matthew was a detested tax collector who was driven by greed. And so what does Jesus do when he meets him? Does he shun him? Does he shame him? No. He invites him. He invites Matthew to follow him. And he does. And Matthew ends up being one of the four authors who writes about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection in the Bible. I just think that's cool. So here's Matthew, and he is giving the account of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, his famous Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew 7, beginning at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, underline or circle that if you have a Bible in front of you, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Say those three words with me. Did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. House on sand, house on rock. 
Let's go back to verse 24, because this is our memory verse. I want to read this together. Read with me. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, I like this particular translation of Matthew 7, 24, because it uses this word practice. Practice. You all know this saying, practice makes what? Perfect. Practice makes perfect. Now, we hear that and we go, yeah, I've heard that a million times. It's true, right? Everyone believes that. Not Wayne Hayes. Who's Wayne Hayes? Wayne Hayes was my high school tennis coach. Now, you didn't know I played high school in tennis. You thought in high school I, I played football, didn't, didn't you? A big football player. <laughs> but I played tennis in high school. Did I mention Percy Harvin already? Okay, yeah. Um, I won't mention him again, though. I played tennis, and, and my tennis coach, Wayne Hayes, uh, was a great man. He, he was a role model for me. He was a Christian. He made a huge impression on my life. But like lots of coaches, he only spoke in cliché. You know what I'm saying? Like sports clichés. And one of his favorite clichés, I can just see his face as he's saying it, Wayne Hayes, he would say, practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. Practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. Now, what was he saying? He was saying a couple of things. One thing he was saying is that, that perfection really isn't the goal. Perfection is maybe unrealistic or even impossible. It's always just beyond our grasp. Perfection. Maybe a better goal is continuous improvement, whatever we're doing. But the second thing he was saying is that how we practice will determine what is made permanent in our lives. How we practice will determine what is made permanent. Something's going to be made permanent. And how we practice, whatever that thing is, will determine what is made permanent. Which means that practice is like really important. How we practice is really important. Because see, if, if we practice the right way, then the right stuff will be made permanent. If we practice the wrong way, then what? The wrong stuff will be made permanent. Now, I, I am excited about spring, and, and I am specifically excited about my golf game in the spring because I play my best golf in the spring. Anyone, any other golfers like that? Why? Because I haven't spent a whole summer, you know, reinforcing bad habits over and over and over again. Essentially practicing the wrong way and making the wrong stuff permanent. At the beginning of the spring, when I first start playing, I'm like, I'm good. And by the end of the summer, I'm like, my game is permanently ruined, you know, until the next spring. If we practice the wrong way, the wrong stuff is made permanent. And it's true when it comes to reading and applying God's word, the Bible as well. If we practice the wrong way, the wrong stuff is made permanent. I need to say this. There's a lot of biblical malpractice out there today. And there's a lot of just people using the Bible the way that it was never intended to be used. Malpractice. Wrong way, wrong stuff's made permanent. But if we practice the right way, the right stuff is made permanent. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7. If we put these words of his into practice the right way, then, then we will be building our house on the rock, and when the storm comes, our house, our life will stand. Practice makes permanent. So, with that in mind, we're going to spend a good deal of time talking about how to practice proper application. I mean, if practice is that important, and how we practice is that important, then we need to make sure we're practicing properly. You with me? So here's where you want to start taking notes, okay? This part of the message is a little more teaching-oriented, and, and I would encourage you to take notes. First, to practice proper application, we ask, what did it mean to them then? What did it mean to them then? Who's then? And who's then? And where's then? When's then? I should say. Uh, them, the people who were originally hearing and reading um, these ancient texts that we now call the, the Bible, this collection that we call the Bible. Then was, in some cases, 2,000 years ago, in some cases, 3,000 years ago. What did it mean to them then? We've hit on this just about every week of the series, so I'm not going to belabor it, but we've talked about historical context. We've talked about observation, the Owen soap. Uh, we've talked about seeing the original setting. Last week, uh, if you were here, you know this, that Shea did an outstanding job of, of showing us how important this, this idea of understanding original context is if we really want to understand the Bible. So I would check that message out online if you haven't already. 
We need to practice asking this question, what did it mean to them then, before asking the question, what, it, what does it mean to me today? That's an important question, and we'll get to it. But if we start with that question, what does it mean to me today, and end with that question, we only get the tip of the iceberg when it comes to reading and applying the Bible. We do. In fact, sometimes we even, we even miss the application altogether, altogether. Now, another part of this practice of asking what did it mean to them then is reading the Bible in, in the context of the whole story, the whole story of the Bible. How many of you are watching the Bible series on the History Channel? I am too, just started to. And that's the idea. We want to know the whole story and then ask, you know, what does this mean in the context of the whole story? Ask what did it mean to them then. Another key to practicing proper application is to use the Bible as a mirror, not a window. Use the Bible as a mirror, not a window. James, who wrote part of the Bible, what we call the New Testament, um, and he was actually the brother of Jesus, which is really cool. But James, he says this, that reading the Bible, getting into the Bible is like looking into a mirror. But here's what we do sometimes. We open the Bible and we read it and we go, man, this is good. This is great. Great idea for somebody else, right? We, we, we end up looking at the Bible that way, and we're not looking at it as a mirror. We're looking at it as a window. We look right through the Bible into the lives of other people. We read the Bible, and, we, and we, we just skip right past what does it mean for our lives, and we're right into what does it mean for other people's lives, like our neighbors and our coworkers, our boss, our family members, our spouse. My wife loves it when I do this. You know, I'm just looking right past what it might mean for me into her life and what it means for her. We do this with culture. We, we, we use the Bible as a window, and we look right through, and we, and we think, oh, man, all those people in culture, they should be living more biblically. No, they shouldn't. You know why? Because those people in culture, they don't, the people who don't, don't believe the Bible. So we shouldn't be surprised when they're not living biblically. We shouldn't think a lot about that because they're not trying to follow this, but we are. And we should be looking into it as, as a mirror, not a window. Now, what, what's at stake if we are using the Bible more like a window than a mirror? Here's what's at stake. If we're always looking at the Bible as a window into other people's lives and how they need to live more biblically, then we never grow. That's what's at stake. We never change. We never see into this this mirror that's, that's showing us who God has created us to be. We stay stuck because practice makes permanent. Jesus says this. He says, look at the plank in your own eye before the speck in someone else's eye. Now, what's the best way to do that? In, into the a window or a mirror? A mirror? Now, as one of your pastors, and there are just maybe two or three of you in here, okay? The rest of you can just check out, right, for a couple minutes. But th- as one of your pastors, for just a few of you in here, if you are reading the Bible or using the Bible more as a window than a mirror, here's what I want to say to you. And I want, I'll try to say it gently and pastorally, okay? Stop it! <laughs> I mean, stop doing that! Literally, stop, stop reading the Bible, You've never heard a pastor say that before. But if you're reading the Bible that way, stop reading the Bible. Um, It it actually isn't helping us out there with the people that we're trying to reach, you know, with God's love, truth. I uh, heard someone say recently that he um, had to detox from the Bible for a while because he was using it the wrong way. And for just a few of you, two or three of you, the rest of you are checked out, you may need to take a break from the Bible so that God can work on your heart and you can start using it more as a mirror, not a window. Because practice makes permanent. Practicing the wrong way makes the wrong stuff permanent. And it makes for a pretty ugly golf game if you're always looking through the Bible as a window. Now, there's something else at stake here. And this, everyone else can come back now, okay? You can come back. And there's something really even bigger at stake. If we're only looking at the Bible as, as a window and not as a mirror, here's what we miss. James, I mentioned him earlier, he says this. If we look into God's perfect law, we experience freedom. 
And if we're looking through it as a window, we miss this. We look into God's perfect law, the Bible, and we can experience freedom in our lives. We can see our true identity and our true destiny. And if we're always looking through it into other people's lives, we may miss this freedom and this destiny and this identity. It's huge. Practice makes permanent. Practice the right way. The right stuff is made permanent. Okay. Ready for a guilt trip? Some of you think, I'm already on one. Thanks, Pastor Ryan. It's just two or three of you, I know. Let's talk about guilt. To practice proper application, make a little guilt go the right way. Make a little guilt go the right way. I want to stress a little guilt. Now, in a previous church experience, I know some of you were led to believe that if you didn't leave church, church wasn't church, unless you walked out of there feeling like, so guilty that you were going to turn yourself into the local police station or something. I mean, you just, you didn't, you didn't even do anything wrong. You just felt so guilty. Or, or maybe uh, you grew up in a church that, that led you to believe that church wasn't church unless the flames of hell were like lapping at your feet by the end of the service, right? Anyone grow up in a church like that? You don't have to raise your hand, but some of you. And, and some of you with a Catholic background, I know you're already feeling guilty and you haven't even gone out for St. Patrick's Day tonight. You know, you're just... <laughs> See, some churches would say this. They would say, make a lot of guilt go a long way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying saying make a little guilt go the right way. Our world does not know what to do with guilt. Doesn't know what to do with it. Either uh, our world says to us, yeah, you know, don't worry. You should never feel guilty. Don't feel bad at all, you know? I mean, you're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay, let's just be okay together, and you don't ever have to feel bad. Or the other extreme in our world that we hear is, you know, it's, it's all you're bad, or you're not good enough, or you need to improve, you need to self-help yourself into helping yourself, and you need, you're, you're, you're bad. And, and the world tells you to beat yourself up. These are two extremes. But somewhere in the middle is what I want to call this little guilt that I believe God and the Bible sometimes stirs up in us this little guilt in the middle. Now, a little guilt can go in two directions. This is really important, okay? Two directions. It can either go in the direction of shame or it can go in the direction of conviction. Shame is the wrong way. Shame is the wrong way. Shame causes us to hide. It's what Adam and Eve do in Genesis 3. After they sin against God, they feel bad, but then it leads to shame. They hide from God. God shows up, and where are they? They're hiding. They're hiding. Shame makes us feel unworthy of of God's love. Satan, by the way, he's real, loves to use shame. Loves to use shame. God doesn't use shame. God doesn't use shame. Conviction is the right way. Conviction says, you know, okay, yeah, I messed up. I screwed up. I need to confess that. I need to repent of that. I need to acknowledge that. Yeah, I messed up. You even need to feel a little bit bad about it because if you don't, you're not going to change. You just need to feel a little bit of that. But it doesn't lead to shame and hiding. It leads to conviction. Now I'm going to change. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to, you know, make this new commitment in my life. I am going, I'm convicted that I'm going to move forward. See the difference? Really, really important distinction. But the Bible, as we read it and apply it, can create some healthy, holy guilt in our lives. The key is to make sure we go the right way with it. Now, when I was learning how to preach, and some of you are thinking, he's still learning how to preach. Okay, yeah, I am. <laughs> I was learning how to preach. I, I heard this phrase, and I remember it, and, and I've hung on to it. When you preach... Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I've hung on to that. And maybe you see that in my preaching. I don't know. But I believe that's also true of the Bible. That the Bible will comfort the afflicted and it will afflict the comfortable at times. Now I know that there are some of you in here that, um, and, and, and hear me, I think about you every time I write a message. You've been on my heart this week as I prepared this message. There are some of you in here that are afflicted. You're in the afflicted category. You're hurting for certain right now. 
I mean, life is a big old mess. You're, you're afflicted. And if that's you, let God's word, let the Bible comfort you. This guy Isaiah, a prophet in, in the Old Testament of the Bible, he, he says, comfort, comfort you, my people. Later on, he says, like a mother comforts her child, I will comfort you, says the Lord. Isaiah, in another place, he says, you who are weary, if you hope in the Lord, you will renew your strength. Find comfort in that. Jesus says, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you rest, comfort you. This guy named Paul, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, and in one place he says, the God of all comfort will comfort you in all your troubles, all your troubles. And then later, Paul, in another, actually in another letter, he says this, nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, nothing. If you are afflicted, let God comfort you. Now, if you're comfortable, and, and you just find yourself getting more and more comforted all the time. And you read the Bible, and it's always about your comfort. And, and you never find yourself getting a little uncomfortable. Stay after church for a special bonus sermon, okay? <laughs> it's fine. Some of you will, which is, I like that. It's funny. <laughs> Another important practice is to get a second opinion. Get a second opinion. I came across this quote a couple of weeks ago. Anytime you are absolutely sure God is on your side... It may be good to get a second opinion. You know, anytime you are absolutely certain that God is on your side in a decision or a situation, it may be good to get a second opinion. There's some wisdom in that. There's some humility in that. Uh, Proverbs says this, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. When we are getting ready to apply something from the Bible, there is this ginormous, is that a word? I think I just made it up. This ginormous potential for life change for change in your life. And so, doesn't it make sense to get a second opinion? To ask a trusted friend or advisor, you know, I think this is what God's word is leading me to do, but what do you think? Even better, get a second opinion from the Bible itself and ask, oh, where, what else does the Bible have to say about this, this topic or this decision or this change in my life? I just think we get second opinions for our health and our finances why wouldn't we do the same with the most important thing in our lives, our relationship with God? Get a second opinion. The last way to practice proper application, and this is really, really important. So if you've been zoning out, thinking about brunch or lunch or whatever, come back. To practice proper application, do what's in the Bible like it's done. Do what's in the Bible like it's done. Here's what I mean. Oftentimes, people look at the Bible, and they get overwhelmed by it, or they get turned off by it because they think, man, that book is just filled with things for me to do. It's filled with more things for me to do. I already have this unmanageable to-do list, and I can't add more to it, you know? Maybe you've even had the thought, I mean, just reading the Bible is on my to-do list, you know, and I'm not even getting to that, let alone all the stuff that the Bible's telling me to do. Ever felt that way? I have. And it's an understandable feeling, it's an understandable thought, but, but it's based on the wrong assumption. It's based on the assumption that the Bible is just a big old to-do list. Let me correct that assumption. The Bible is not primarily filled with more stuff for you to do. It's primarily filled with stuff that God has done for you. Did you hear that? The Bible is not primarily filled with more stuff for you to do. It's primarily filled with stuff that God has done for you. Hear that? Another way to say it is the Bible is not about what you have to do for God. It's about what you can do now. What you get to do because of what Jesus has done for you. It's the difference between reading the Bible prescriptively and descriptively, and I could talk a lot about that, but what I want to say is, instead, <laughs> approaching the Bible this way, instead of as a big old to-do list, will revolutionize how you see and read and apply the Bible. Absolutely revolutionize it. Do what's in the Bible like it's done. 
Tyler, when he was up here, I love it when Tyler gets up here, don't you? He did announcements, he's so cool. I was thinking he should just do the sermon, the message, you know? But he, he told us about our Good Friday service, and the Good Friday service uh, is the Friday right before our Easter services, and, and I agree with what he said. It's a good way to prepare for Easter. It's a profound and, and moving service. We reflect on the seven last statements of Jesus. And one of the seven last statements of Jesus is this, three words, it is finished. It is finished, Jesus says on the cross. What's it? It is your sins have been paid for. Your, your salvation, your eternity has been secured in Jesus Christ. You can know how God feels about you. It is finished. It's done. Paul, uh, I mentioned him earlier. He, he writes about running the race, running the race and finishing the race. And we can finish the race, but here's why. Because it is finished. It is finished. Do what's in the Bible like it's done. It's kind of an abstract thought, but it's so critical. So critical. And as our fearless leader often says, just let that one lean on your mind for a minute, okay? So after a little abstract thought, and, but it's critical. Let's get real practical here for a few moments. Get real practical. Ask the question, what does a good biblical application look like? And this is in your notes too, and I'm just going to tell you, I shamelessly stole this out of the 40-day study guide. So here you go. A good biblical application is personal, practical, possible, and provable. Personal, practical, possible, and provable. It's personal, a good biblical application. We put it into the first person. Remember, we're reading it you know, as a mirror. Use I and we statements. Practical. It's something specific. It's something simple. Specific and simple that you can actually do. It's possible. Something realistic, you know, Something you know you can accomplish. And then it's provable. It's measurable. It's something you can actually assess. So get them. A good biblical application is personal, practical, possible, and provable. Okay. Now we have reached the point where the rubber hits the road. James, he, sa he says this. James had a lot to say and he said this. He said, do not merely be hearers of the word, do what it says. Now you got to fill in the, you know, like it's done, but do what it says. Don't just hear it. Jesus says that in Matthew 7. He says, those who hear these words of mine and put them into practice, practice makes permanent. Not just hear them, but do them, practice them. So let's practice. And you can practice on me for a moment, Okay. This makes me sound like a human punching bag or something, but uh, let's practice on me. I, uh, you need to know this about me. I am a recovering people pleaser. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, some of you, you aren't even in recovery yet. You need to get into recovery, okay, on this one? And here, here's the thing about being a people pleaser. Uh, there's a point at which it's good to care about people, but there's a point at which caring about people becomes caring too much about what they think of you, which really isn't caring for people anymore. It's caring about actually who? You. So people-pleasing actually is just really, you know, this whole self-absorbing experience. Now, if you can relate to that, there's good news. There's an app for that. Okay? <laughs> there, there's an application for that. And it comes from one of my life verses, Galatians 1.10. Galatians 1.10. Paul wrote this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. 
Okay, let's make, let's make it pers- personal. Let's practice this. Put my name in, but you can put your name in. If Ryan is still trying to please people, then he is not being a servant of Christ. She's a personal pronoun now. If I am still trying to please people, then I am not being a servant of Christ. Make it personal. It sounds almost like a confession, doesn't it? Yeah. An affirmation, it could be turned into an affirmation. I am trying to please God, not people. A prayer. Now let's turn it into an application statement. Starting with these two words, this week, this week, okay, this is the possible P. Don't say, for the next 87 years of my life, or even a New Year's resolution, because we all know how those go, but just make it possible. This week, I am going to seek God's approval over the approval of others. That's the, that's the application right there. That's the nugget. That's where we're trying to drive home some change. We want God to to bring some change there. By running my day through the filter of Galatians 1.10 three times a day. That's the practical P. Something something practical that you can do. Uh, What would this look like? Three times a day, setting aside time morning, afternoon, and and night to run your life, your day, through this filter of Galatians 1.10. To look back and, and, and... And ask that question, am I living to please people or God? Maybe even confess a little bit there. To look ahead into the next part of your day and say, okay, God, I want to live to please you, not people. To certainly in that moment to say a prayer, God, help me to do this because I can't do it on my own. And that's really important. We won't be able to do this or any of the thousands of applications that are in the Bible without um, God's presence and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, doing supernaturally what we can't do naturally. You see how this is turning into an application? What about the other P, provable? How do you prove this? Well, one way to answer that would be, you know, did I actually do this three times a day for a week? And here's, here's my thought on that. If you were to do something like this or whatever, you know, the application is for you three times a day in the Bible and actually do it I guarantee you, that's a little bit risky to say that, but I guarantee you, you would experience change in your life. God's word just has that power combined with the Holy Spirit. But still, that's doing it. Now, how do you prove the outcome? How do you prove that this has actually led to a different outcome? Other applications are more quantifiable, more objective, you know, like weight loss or, or, you know, finances, other applications. This is more subjective. But, but I would say on an application like this, the proof's in the pudding. The proof's in the pudding. What do I mean? I mean that the people around you should be able to see a change, and the people close to you should be able to ask them, do you see a difference here? Am I, am I living to please God, or am I living, living to please people? I love my wife, because she will always shoot straight with me on this. I've worked really hard on this, not saying I love my wife, but, okay? I love my wife because she will shoot straight. She'll tell me where I am. You see how this verse has been turned into an application that you can practice. And practice makes what? Permanent. And I have been practicing this verse, not quite this way all the, all, all the way through, but I've been practicing this verse for like years and years practicing And now, here's the thing. I don't care what you think, all right? Okay. So let me make sure you listen. I mean, I I do. It's not about perfection, right? And it's okay to care a little bit about what other people think. But I have grown over the years to care way less about what other people think and way more about what God thinks. You hear what I'm saying? I, I have grown to care way less about seeking others' approval and way more about God's approval. And what's so amazing about God's approval is that in Jesus Christ, you got it. You got his approval. In fact, in Jesus Christ, you, keep, you have as much approval as you're ever going to get. You have his full and complete approval in Jesus Christ. You don't have to seek more of it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to wonder, can I have more of his approval in Jesus Christ? You have his full approval. And let me tell you, that changes everything about how you live your life. Everything. Thing changes. And we've been saying right from the very beginning of this series, and actually the beginning of this service for those of you who showed up on time. 
that the purpose, conviction, not shame, all right? The purpose, <laughs> the purpose of the Bible is what? Changed lives. And so as we wrap up this series today, I'm going to put that question before you again. How does your life need to change? How does your life need to change? How might you need to experience more conviction in your life? How do you need to grow? Let's personalize this as we wrap up this series. Put a personal imprint on it. And so, as a way of doing this, we're going to give you just a couple of moments to reflect on those questions. How does my life need to change? Where do I need to have more conviction? How do I need to grow? Just a couple of minutes to reflect, to listen to God, and then respond in the moment, maybe write that thing down or turn to someone next to you, probably someone you came with, but just turn to someone next to you and whisper, this is what it is for me. Or if you don't do either one of those, then just lock it in mentally. I'm gonna give you a moment, a couple moments here, just to reflect and personalize this. And while you're doing that, I'll step back and pray for those seven people who don't think they need to change, okay? Let's reflect. something so you have like 17 things just one or two is okay and if you have something an area to grow in something that needs to change then let me help you identify your what we like to call in grow link your next best step here's what it is take that that growth area or that thing that needs to change in your life and open Open the Bible this week. You don't even have to believe it. Just open it. Try it. And then, as you look into it like a mirror, not a window, find a verse or a passage or a story that fits where God's leading you. And we have people around here that would love to help you with that. If you, you know, just find yourself going, I don't know where to start. We'd, we'd love to help you. And then, put into practice everything we've learned in this series, what we talked about today, and make an application out of it. Just like I, I did with Galatians 1.10. Make it provable, right? Ask someone to help you with that, maybe. And then from there, here's what I'd say. Practice and practice and practice and practice because practice makes permanent in your life. Just like Jesus says in Matthew 7, if you put my words into practice, you'll be building your house, your life on the rock. And as the storm comes and the wind and the waves, 
your house, your life will stand. There will be a permanence last. And that's my hope and my prayer for you. I'm going to pray for you about that in a minute. But first, I want to extend a, a special invitation this morning. As we wrap up our series, wouldn't it just make a lot of sense for you to come forward with whatever you wrote on paper, you locked in mentally, or whatever it is, to say, yeah, this is my next best step. Come forward for prayer. Kind of seal the deal. It's all confidential. You can go to the prayer chapel, too. These trained prayer ministers would love to, to pray with you, kind of seal the deal around this commitment, and then put some wind behind your sails as you go from here, the Holy Spirit behind your sails. And then lastly, there, there are just maybe a handful of people. You're so close to my heart, but I want to say this, that the biggest change that could take place in your life would be for you to know that you have God's full approval in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, you are his son. You are his daughter. And if that's you, I would come forward. I wouldn't waste a second more of this life, but come forward. Have someone pray for you or in the prayer chapel. Please stand so I can pray for all of you right now. Oh God, we're landing the plane here on this series. And there's been a lot that we've learned and there's been a lot that we've experienced even today, Lord. But you're so good, God, at knowing exactly what we need of helping us personalize this, of making it personal. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word, which as we look into this perfect law, this perfect word, we can experience freedom. And I pray for each and every person here today, Lord, that however you're stern on their heart, wherever they are on the journey, we're all on a journey. God, that you would continue to give them courage and conviction. Be the wind behind their sails, God. That they would move into that next chapter of life that you have for them. God, we thank you that because of your word and the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, our lives can change. You... you Embrace us and love us just the way we are, and yet you love us too much to leave us there. So thank you, God, that we can experience all that you have for us. And may that happen, just one more step for each person here today, and one step after that. And now lead us as we pray the prayer that you taught us, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.